Could a married priesthood become normative? The working document of the upcoming Amazon Synod contains a proposal for just that. The papal posse, Robert Royal and Father Gerald Murray, offer in-depth analysis of that and much more. And mother of Maddie Stepanek, the poet and peace advocate, Dr. Jenny Stepanek returns for an update of her son's cause for sainthood. The World Over begins right now. Now, from Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. A great show for you tonight. Robert Royal, Father Gerald Murray, and Jenny Stepanek are all here. If you'd like to comment on tonight's show, send me a tweet. I'm at Raymond Arroyo. <laughs> joining me now with analysis is the Papal Posse, editor-in-chief of thecatholicthing.org. Robert Royal is here in studio. And canon lawyer and priest of the Archdiocese of New York, Father Gerald Murray joins me from Manhattan. Gentlemen, thank you for being here. Now, the Instrumentum Laboris, that's the working document, for this upcoming Amazon Synod was released on Monday. The 64-page document will form the basis of discussion for this upcoming Synod in October in the Vatican. Now, it's broken into three sections, and the document focuses heavily on ecological issues, liturgical inculturation, community organizing, and ecumenism interreligious dialogue. Now, the section on inculturation encourages marriage and Christian initiation liturgies to be, quote, festive with their own music and dances, using indigenous languages and clothing in communion with nature and with the community. It also asks the bishops' conferences to adapt the Eucharistic rite to their cultures. Robert Royal, what does this mean? Well, it's a big vision. This is, this is one thing. It's a big document and a repetitive document. And I try to have my word uh, program tell me how many times dialogue and indigenous were in there, and it, it couldn't count that high. I, I think. But look, there, the main thing here is we, we hear about all these specific things, possibility of married men uh, be, being ordained, role for women, all the things you just mentioned. But actually, the word uh, paradigm is mentioned a lot, that this Amazon... Uh, situation can become a kind of global paradigm for the church going forward. Yeah, what does that mean? Well, I think that the Holy Father, since he became Pope, has always talked about how the developing world, like Latin America, they're going to be able to inform the first world. Now, I have a, a great deal of sympathy with the idea that we recover our relationship to nature as part of creation, as mm -hmm. a, having a divine element in it. And that is very present throughout this entire document, as it was in Laudato Si and other right. things that this Pope has put out. But the place where I think that it begins to pinch a little bit, for me at least, and probably for a lot of other people, is that there is a very strong focus on indigenous visions of the cosmos, languages, uh, it, it, you know, the way that their, their cultures uh, operate. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that that is going to be all that much of a paradigm for the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it's good to reach out to indigenous peoples. Yeah. It's good to find ways that, that are effective within their own cultures. But the indigenous people are not re reading this document. This is clearly intended for the developed world, right. and this is a, a rebuke of a lot of things, mm -hmm. partly that are rebukable, and said, but partly other things that I think are, are much more iffy. Father, I want to share this with you. It's from the document, uh, this uh, preparatory document for this synod on the Amazon. Uh, communities find it difficult to celebrate the Eucharist frequently because of the lack of priests. The church draws her life from the Eucharist, and the Eucharist builds the church. Therefore, instead of leaving the communities without the Eucharist, change is requested in the criteria for selecting and preparing ministers authorized to celebrate the Eucharist. Paragraph 129 goes on, stating that celibacy is a gift for the church. We ask that for more remote areas in the region study of the possibility of priestly ordination of elders, preferably indigenous. They can already have established and stable families, and in order to ensure the sacraments that they accompany and support the Christian life. Now, Father, it's long been rumored that married priests would be a proposition, at least, at this synod. Your thoughts on this idea and whether the shortage of priests in the Amazon is a good excuse to ordain married men in the Western Church? 
Yeah, I see right here, Raymond, uh, the uh, fulfillment of a dream that came up after Vatican II uh, by, frankly, liberals in the church, which was to abolish priestly celibacy. And Pope Paul VI, now a saint, uh, wrote a document rebuking that attitude and saying we weren't going to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, celibacy is connatural with the priesthood. Jesus Christ was not married, and from the ancient times in the church, uh, married men were, who were ordained were asked to live celibacy, and then the church went to ordaining just celibate males. Mm -hmm. I think what we're seeing here is something we saw at the Synod on the Family, which is it's not really focused on, it wasn't focused on the family, it was focused on communion for divorce and remarried. Now we're seeing a focus on the ordination of married men. I have a lot of problems with this because the same criteria that will be invoked here in uh, Brazil and in Peru in the jungle are not too many priests, people need to have mass. Well, the same thing can be evoked in different parts of the United States, Europe, wherever you want. Uh, celibacy is an integral gift of God to the church that has been constitutive of the apostolic efforts of the church through the centuries. And to cast it aside on the pretext that because people can't get to Mass as frequently as possible in the Amazon, mm -hmm. I just don't think that's not something the church ought to do. We ought mm -hmm. to see that this is really a ploy, in my opinion, needs mm -hmm. to be turned aside because it has serious, serious reper repercussions for the rest of the church. Now, a couple of weeks ago, Cardinal Walter Casper said, if the bishops agreed through mutual consent to ordain married men, those called viri probati, it's my judgment, Casper's, that the pope would accept it. Celibacy isn't a dogma. It's not an unalterable practice. Robert Royal. Well, it's true that there are rites within the church that have married clergy. The, right. the Anglican Ordinariate and some of the Eastern churches Eastern right, do, yeah. do have married clergy. So there, there are variations. But I think Father is exactly right that this, uh, th this step is not intended to remain solely in the, the obscure parts of the rainforest in, in South America. I think this is the, the trial balloon mm. that will get that kind of conversation going. I mean, it's, even if it's not intended in Rome, mm -hmm. I think it is, but even if it's not, it's very clear that people in the United States, Germany, and other places where there are strong liberal contentions will take advantage of that example, that paradigm, and say we need to have Mary Well, and, and here again, we're hearing that great man of the Amazon, Walter Casper, <laughs> raising his voice, you know, beating his drum for another kind of innovation and adaptation of, of teaching, church teaching and practice. Now, paragraph 129 also suggests that the bishops of the world consider identifying the type of official ministry that can be conferred on women, considering the central role they play in the Amazon today. Now, Father Jerry, the Pope has said he's not willing to ordain women. What do you make of this and this particular suggestion? Well, my guess is that uh, the people who wrote this document uh, want either women deacons or women priests. Uh, they talk about official ministries. Uh, let's remember something. The priesthood, a sacrament, was a gift from Christ to the church. It wasn't a human invention. It wasn't a good idea the apostles came up with. This is a gift from God to the church, and therefore it is determined by God's intention. And the intention, the church has always said, is only to ordain men. Now, by focusing on what they call official ministries, uh, they're ignoring the fact that women are among the prime evangelizers in families and communities and parishes and schools. Uh, and that work is invaluable. It's something that is done by lay women, by religious women. No, again, I see here a ploy, an attempt to use a discussion based on the needs uh, in the far rainforest mm -hmm. uh, to say to the church, we're out of step with uh, what we need to do. do. And my answer is no. Whatever Jesus determined for the church, we not, must not only obey it, we must affirm it as being good. I've gotten a lot of letters in the past week, Father, since this document dropped. Uh, and some are concerned about that line, and I read it early on, to adapt the Eucharistic rite to your cultures. Does that concern you, or is that just inculturation? No, uh, this is one of the biggest problems that we've been experiencing in the church since the end of the council. Uh, the Council's intent was that the rites of the Mass uh, be updated to the extent of making them more accessible to people as, so as to appreciate the rite itself. Mm -hmm. It was not meant to create new rites or to confer, as this document seems to do, some kind of divine sanction 
on practices that are quite frankly pagan practices that need to be suppressed. Mm. So, you know, adapting the liturgy basically makes man-centered focus, not Christ-centered, and it turns the liturgy into a show. Mm. Uh, the Holy Mass is an act of worship of God, and Christ is the high priest, or we stand in the place of Christ as altar Christus at the altar. This should not be about, you know, costumes, local folkloric elements, and the idea that everybody's got to get on the act, we've got to give them a role. Uh, and that's what these unfortunate created liturgies turn into. They mm. become very man-centered. Mm. In this document uh, on the section that touches spirituality and wisdom, we find this. For the indigenous peoples of the Amazon basin, the good life comes from living in communion with other people, with the world, with the creatures of their environment, and with the creator. Indigenous peoples, in fact, live within the home that God created and gave them as a gift, the earth. Their diverse spiritualities and beliefs motivate them to live in communion with the soil, water, trees, animals, with day and night. Wise elders, called interchangeably pious, mestres, wayaga, and chamans, among others, promote the harmony of people among themselves and with the cosmos. Robert Royal, what is the Vatican endorsing here? I mean, this sounds like, you know, uh, uh, James Cameron's going to come out <laughs> and give us another uh, movie. I mean, there is a lot of the noble savage in this document. I mean, I think we have to mm -hmm. just say that there's, um, there, there were very few cautions. The traffic is almost always... And, and it's said explicitly in a couple of places, you have much to, to evangelize us yeah. with. Now, again, other than that main paradigm point that we, we in the West have lost a little bit of the sense of, of nature as God's creation, as, as embracing, in a way, some truths that God wants to communicate to us. But the rest of this is very much... Um, it's it's hard to see what we're what we're bringing. I mean, it is mentioned at a couple of points mm -hmm. that we're we're introducing people to Jesus Christ, but everything else is almost they're telling us what the church ought to be. And I, I, I again, I go back to this point that I think that is very much the idea of what this new paradigm is going to be. That somehow this rather small number of indigenous peoples mm -hmm. um, in a place like the Amazon, even in the Amazon, as the document admits. Um, there's a lot of urbanization going on, and, and there, these communities have been disrupted. And it reminds you almost in a way of 19th century England and Dickens, that mm. in this transition from a, a kind of an agricultural life to a different kind of life, there are, are many problems. There's drugs, alcoholism, human trafficking, poverty, the breakup of families, the breakup of communities. But the future is not going to be to go back to these these small indigenous communities living in the rainforest. The future is going to be, you know, some, we hope, some integration of a cosmic idea of creation mm -hmm. with modernity, I suppose. So, Father Jerry, we're not going to have you as an avatar go to the go to the Amazon and learn from the wise elders. Uh, give me a sense of uh, your take on the, the document's almost endorsement of these separatist tribes, keeping them separate and apart from the rest of the world. I thought the church's mission, obligation, was to go and evangelize everyone, bring everybody into Christ's family. Um, but here they almost make the case that we need to leave these pure people alone. Yeah, um, this is a misplaced romanticism, as Bob says, the idea of the noble savage who's ruined by contact with Western man. Uh, this is nonsense, I'll be blunt. Uh, the Catholic Church was created by Jesus Christ in order to promote the salvation of the world. Jesus picked the place. It started in Israel, went to Europe, and then the Europeans uh, brought it to many places in the New World, including Latin America. And, you know, I spent time in uh, Ecuador as a seminarian. I spent two months there studying Spanish. Mm -hmm. And uh, the piety of the indigenous people was very evident. They loved the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. So did you know, roll up a new meeting and say, hey, by the way, folks, you know, shamans, these local uh, pagan priests, you know, they're going to teach us what it means to be human and what it means to be kind and all the rest. This is counterintuitive. It's really destructive. What needs to be done is the church should send missionaries to all the different places and announce them the good news of Jesus Christ and then purify, you know, what is bad in those cultures. Let's not forget when the Mexican uh, Incas uh, were conquered by the Spaniards, the Spaniards put it into human sacrifice. And also the Incas were, impress uh, were oppressing the neighboring tribes. There was constant warfare going on. 
Uh, this romantic notion that people live in the jungle are peaceful until Western man shows up, this is not proven by history, and it certainly is not part of the uh, gospel understanding of divine providence. Robert, you wanted to add before yeah, we move I, on. You know, I think our, our, our viewers might want to look at Mel Gibson's movie Ap Apocalypto. Oh, Apocalypto, It's just a right. very realistic vision of what it was like to be in a small tribe and then be captured as a slave and then yeah. people being sacrificed with their hearts being cut out. And then at the very end, there's a Spanish galleon that shows yeah, up that, you know, right. on the water. So, look, the Spaniards... And, and we in North America also did terrible things. Yeah, to they brought disease. And, yeah, and, they, they had excesses. And we get it. But the, the, look, the main point of evangelization is obviously going to be bringing Jesus Christ and the vision of what that means for human beings to everybody in the world, as you right, rightly yeah. say. And I, I think just the traffic seems to be going in a different direction. Okay, rapid fire, because I've got to move on to a few other issues before we run out of time. Father, do you think we're going to see? this uh, ordaining the wise elders as part of this synod. Do you think the bishops will endorse it? I hope not because it, it, it would be a radically uh, uh, bad notion that you simply take uh, an old man in, in, a, in a town, impose hands on him, ordain him a priest, and then send him out to say mass and hear confessions. What about seminary training? One of the most important things we've heard since the council is priests need to be better trained to be able to deal with the challenges of the modern world and to preach the gospel effectively. So I hope and pray that that will not happen. But uh, this synod, by the way, is not exactly a broadly representative of, of all of Latin America. It's focused on part of it. And there may be intense pressure put on people from that part of the world to say, let's go with this. Well, I hope not. Robert Royal, your take. Yeah, I, look, the... Um, the, the simple fact of the matter here is that we've got a problem in certain parts of Latin America that Latin Americans themselves haven't been seem to be able to solve. That um, you would hope that there would be enough priests that you could be able to staff these places. I don't know exactly what is going to happen with these very probati. I don't think they can just put them out there to say mass and to, and mm -hmm. to hear confessions and to bring uh, communion. But the, the clear resolution here is going to be at some point to be able to actually have enough ordained clergy, trained clergy to go out and really bring the fullness of the gospel to people mm -hmm. who desperately need to hear it. And as Father rightly says, they, they, when they hear it, they like it very much. Mm -hmm. Look, I, I wrote a book about uh, 1492 and all that. It was my very first bit, book. And uh, w one of the, uh, the phrases that I came across from Carlos Fuentes, who's a Mexican novelist, he was an ambassador to the United States, he says, you have to think about the tremendous change in mentality it must have meant to those indigenous peoples to find out that the Christian God was a God who sacrificed himself for men rather than men sacrificing other men to God. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a, an entire turnaround in the, in the religious view of the Aztecs, mm -hmm. the, the Mexicas in, in Mexico. So right. there, is a, there is a wonderful liberating truth here, and we've got to find a way to convey it. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about this. The Congregation for Education in Rome recently released a statement on gender theory in education. And it's called, he created them male and female. And there are some criticizing the statement. What do we need to know? Robert Royal. Yeah, I wrote a column about this the other day because I was pleasantly surprised. I've heard from people since that it, you know, it didn't for example, tell parents how to resist the, 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 uh, right. the imposition of this ideology of transgenderism, which is happening in libraries and kids' TV programs and whatnot. But I think that it really laid out a strong case, I mean, from the very title, male and female, he created them. You already see that it's pointed in a certain direction. Clearly, the LGBT community, the New York Times, Father James Martin, did not like what they saw here. And uh, Cardinal Versaldi, who is the head of that congregation for education, said, well, we, you know, we, we wanted to tell educational institutions how to deal with th this problem. And it really goes to the heart. It goes to the heart of saying there is a metaphysics of the, and, and ontology of the human person that cannot be ignored. We cannot simply separate ourselves from our bodies and say, I'm male or I'm female because I have some some emotion or I have a whim that I want to be the one thing or the other. And they say that that explicitly. So look, there's plenty more that can be said about this question of transgenderism. But this is an amazing step forward and it's it's agitated all the right people and I think it gives us a place to begin to be, to move in a different direction. Father Jerry, what do you make of the, the bit there where the document's calling for more dialogue? Uh, the, some of the email correspondence I've been getting in since the document dropped says dialogue with whom? Who are you dialoguing with? 
Yeah, that part of the document, that aspect which is sort of dominant is that the church has to enter into dialogue with the proponents of gender ideology. Uh, that's naive. The, the people who promote gender ideology resist and hate the Catholic Church's teaching. They're not interested in discussing it. In fact, there's one thing you, you notice in the public discussion. As soon as someone questions the existence, you know, of a third sex or a transsexual person, they immediately have a social excommunication. They said, you're an evil person, you're not going to dis I'm not going to discuss this with you. So Bob is right, this document teaches precisely what is, you know, the metaphysical truth of creation. But its, its attitude, I think, is naive, where it's the idea of, well, we can find some proponents of this, discuss it with them, and try to convince them they're wrong. No, the main proponent, the main thing the church needs to do is warn people to stay away from this ideology, because it is dangerous. I need to share something else with you. Uh, this was a story the Pope met with all of his nuncios. This was just last week. And in doing so, he warned them. And it was a curious line that was picked up across the world. Uh, he says this. We'll put it on the screen. It is therefore irreconcilable, he said, to be a pontifical representative criticizing the pope behind his back, having blogs or even joining groups hostile to him, to the curia or to the church of Rome. Clearly, this is a shot at Carlo Maria Vigano, the former nuncio here in the United States, who has since published testimonies and given interviews, which we'll get to some of the latest revelations in a moment. Uh, Robert Royal, your reaction? Well, I mean, it's clear that this was intended for a specific person, uh, because that is the biggest thing out there on the, uh, on, on the horizon. Uh, in a way, look, it's okay for him to remind people that they are the representatives of the pope and should... Um, they, they should be his representative and not be representing themselves. But, sure. but that ignores an entire set of problems that exist right now. What happens uh, if the current nuncio in the United States discovers something about an existing cardinal, bishop, archbishop, and is told by Rome, no, we're not going to talk about that? Right. We, we've, we've learned that there are dynamics inside that proper loyalty to the Holy Father that we all have to feel as Catholics yeah. that can lead to serious problems and work against some things that are crucial to the credibility of the mm -hmm. church at this moment. So, okay, fine, you remind the, the nuncios in various countries, you know, you're, you're like an ambassador. You're the representative of, of the, home, um, right. the home office. But at the same time, we don't want to, that to be taken to the point that it simply quashes everything, yeah. all the other moral and, and uh, spiritual questions that are arising. Father, is this a, a conflicted message where on the one hand you're saying you've got to come out and report everything you see, any wrongdoing you see. On the other hand, you know, you better be loyal to the Pope and the Curia. You're a representative here. Yeah, no, I think Bob is right. As ambassadors, they must uh, represent the Pope and uh, in front of civil governments and the bishops of a country. But, you know, I'd like to think that the Pope is also interested in hearing from them that gospel frankness that he spoke about at the Synod of the Family, mm -hmm. where he, remember, he told the delegates at that Synod, speak your mind freely, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think the, uh, let's say, the good of the church depends on faithfulness to the truth. And at times, people will be offended. Uh, this whole Vigano matter, which, you know, is still very much pending in the minds of people, mm -hmm. will not be resolved by everybody staying quiet. Uh, we need to know precisely what happened, and that is not a criticism of the Pope per se to, to, to say, well, look, the McCarrick matter is bothering the American people and others. Let's get to the bottom of it. Yeah, and this, you, you bring up McCarrick. This is the one-year anniversary of the McCarrick revelations. Um, as we know, Car Carlo Maria Vigano, Archbishop Vigano, was a part of that revelation, and it shocked people when they realized, oh, my gosh, the Cardinal World knew. The Pope knew. These individuals knew. At least that's the allegations that Vigano has put forward. And thus far, he hasn't been proven wrong. No. Uh, and we'll get into some of his more recent uh, allegations. But let's start with McCarrick. What do we know now, and should we know more? Robert Royal. Well, we should know a lot more, because if today is exactly one year since the, the official announcement of mm -hmm. the findings from the Archdiocese of New York, um, we've been promised along the way that there's going to be a full investigation, there, there will be documents that will be released, and we haven't seen anything of, the, of that mm -hmm. sort. In fact, we've had other confirmations by Monsignor Figueredo, for example, that, and he points to specific 
letters and, and documents that people can right. go and find. And, and you know, we're encouraging journalists to be investigators to go out and look into this thing. But we've got nothing. And I know you probably hear this too from your your, your viewers. Yeah. I know from our readers at the Catholic thing that some of them are extremely frustrated initially with our bishops here in the United States. Mm -hmm. But there at least is some movement among the bishops, however mm -hmm. more there is to be done. Mm -hmm. The frustration with Rome is immense at this point because yeah. the, the obviously the McCarrick thing is the most notorious large-scale yeah. thing that the, the man who was the Cardinal Archbishop of Washington mm -hmm. could, could get away with this sort of thing. So unless this is resolved, yeah. Rome is going to have a big problem with the United States going yeah. forward. Yeah, and, there, and speaking of Vigano, uh, Father Jerry, more allegations came forward this week. Uh, journalist Marco Tosati talked to uh, uh, Card uh, Archbishop Vigano. He made allegations against the current rector at the National Shrine here. He's in recent days made allegations against Vatican officials, very high-ranking officials, and, and at least a, one priest who he charges with uh, being involved in sexual misdeeds as a seminarian. Your thoughts on this? In focusing so exclusively on McCarrick, do we miss the ongoing crimes and the ongoing malefactors today? Well, we have to look at the, the fallout from the McCarrick matter, which was a revelation that uh, McCarrick had done evil deeds. They were reported, and then nothing happened. Or what happened was a private uh, set of uh, restrictions that when he mm -hmm. ignored them, uh, no one called him to task. Uh, the Archbishop of Washington at the time, Cardinal World, did know about them. That's been proven, uh, and the Figueredo testimony backs that up. And yet, McCarrick was allowed to circulate freely. And it, it, mm -hmm. well, let's, go, let's go back to really what we're talking about here. It's not simply McCarrick. There's been a culture of moral corruption mm. in the hierarchy. Uh, numbers of bishops have been removed uh, or proven to have acted immorally. Or convicted. After their, uh, or convicted, even. Uh, you know, the rector of the National Shrine has now been accused in public of immoral activity. Uh, I think it behooves the Archdiocese of Washington to announce that they're going to investigate these charges to get to the truth. Because, frankly, if he's innocent, he deserves to have his name vindicated. Correct. And if he's guilty, he should be removed. Now, one of those two things happens if action is taken. If we sit around and say, well, newspaper reports are not worthy to look at, uh, we're just going to kind of sit here and let the man continue in his job uh, without any problem, that's not an adequate solution. That's more or less what happened to McCarrick. Nothing mm -hmm. became public. And he continued on his way. Yeah. We also do see connections here. And I do think, you know, last week I said th 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 there's something vampiric about all of this, where we have an individual who then ordains somebody else, and then they go on. And, and it's like the sin continues, the corruption continues through generations. Should we begin looking at that, the DNA, the pedigree of the men currently in office and those who are coming? Who brought you to the fair? Right. I mean, we haven't mentioned the name of Bishop Bransfield. Right, Michael Bransfield who, in West Virginia. Um, I, mean, I can say this as somebody who's been living in Washington for a long time. There were rumors about him when he was the rector of the Shrine of the Immaculate Conception mm -hmm. here that were basically similar to what we learned about McCarrick. And yeah. we didn't have an investigation until he was appointed the bishop in West Virginia. And then things came to light, and Archbishop Lori dug into this, and I think yeah. a reasonably good job with it. But of course, look, we, we had McCarrick, Whirl, you know, Whirl knowing about McCarrick. We had the appointment of Bransfield, and I'm sure that if I heard rumors about Bransfield, I'm sure that Cardinal Whirl heard, heard them. And then Bransfield moves on, and his successor now it seems to be um, pursuing the same kind of line. So there seems to be a whole network, a certain kind of DNA of. of a family resemblance here that, you know, people have used arguments like a mafia or networks of, of uh, homosexuals. I think we, we're almost at the point where we have the proof positive that that's the case, mm -hmm. at, at least here. Yeah. So, and who knows how many other places this, there appear to be many other similarities to situations in Rome and, and, mm -hmm. and Latin America and other parts of the world. So this is a big problem that has got to be, I think Father is exactly right. You take very concrete steps. Mm -hmm. uh, you dig into this, and you either prove the allegations or you exonerate somebody. But there can't just be sweeping this under the rug and hoping it'll go away any but, longer. But, but do you think that will suffice? Father Jerry, look, I get letters and emails all day long from upset laity, some clergy, who are like, what do we do? They feel powerless. They're very upset. But there doesn't seem to be a an organized point to their to their anger. They don't know what to do with it. 
and what I see are people simply walking away. They're dropping their, 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 dropping their affiliation and leaving the church. And that's most unfortunate because the fact that some shepherds are really wolves doesn't mean that there isn't a true flock and that there are good shepherds. You know, mm -hmm. Christ is the principal shepherd of the church and then the bishops, the pope, the priests, we all act, you know, according to the model of Christ. If we fail to do that, we need to be taken to task. Now, one thing I think that will help the laity is if the Vatican finally wraps up its investigation of the McCarrick matter and then issues a clear statement uh, showing the evidence to prove or disprove what Vigano said. Uh, because, you know, quite frankly, with the Vigano charges cannot simply be left to float no. out there as one man's, you know, reminiscences that may or may not be true, and we don't know if the evidence. Look, the, he said quite clearly, documentary evidence in Vatican and Washington Archdiocese archives will prove the truth of what I said. He said that now it's up to the Vatican to say, we accept the challenge because the facts have come out apart from our investigation about McCarrick. Mm -hmm. It had to, you know, the victims of McCarrick were the one who prompted the action. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is a sign of manifest dysfunction in the way the hierarchy dealt with this man. Yeah, well, by the all, way, yeah, what, it's almost now you know, there's a where, reluctance where, to bring forth information because it might prove Vigano was right. So, so now we're like yeah. operating against Vigano rather than the, the malefactors here. No, we have to have gospel honesty. And, you know, things are messy in life. And when there are accusations flying one way or the other, you step back, you become objective, and you say, fine. You say there's evidence, we found it, you're right. You say there's evidence, there is no evidence. If you can't prove mm -hmm. it, then your allegation falls. That's how we deal with things in life. The church needs to be like this. Quite frankly, it's very upsetting to hear that the Vatican is still trying to collect their archives about McCarrick so they can make them public. Mm -hmm. They've been investigating since September. This is June. Yeah. We're crying out loud, how many documents are there? Well, here's my question, Robert Royal. Why are we going through the charade of an investigation when they forced an administrative withdrawal upon him? They basically forced him out without a hearing. So, w Was there something that might have come out in the hearing? And that's what the lay people are saying. Wait a minute. We, w he was entitled to a hearing. They should have let McCarrick be tried. That didn't happen. Yeah. I mean, there are some people who argue that they wanted to have a, a lay down a marker before that we had the summit back mm -hmm. in February in Rome about uh, about uh, abuse. But I agree with you entirely. The the uh, the mere fact of the matter is there have been people who have been arguing that even reducing McCarrick to the lay state is not enough. I mean, we're all lay people, other than mm -hmm. father. And um, what is, is our is it a punishment to be You're a lay, lay person? Trash you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, some people have said he should have been excommunicated mm. because what we want from him is a sense of repentance yeah. and, and, and apologies to people here in Washington and other dioceses that he served in. But there's, there is going to be no resolution. People are not going to be okay with this unless we get some real answers out of Rome. And I think that you're right to say, so far what we've seen, it almost looks as if the fact that this has been brought out has been further reason to push that stuff further mm -hmm. into the no, background. No, no, no. The whistleblower is the bad guy. There are no other bad guys, just the whistleblower. That doesn't add up. Anywhere in, anywhere in society, the whistleblower, if he makes a charge, as Father said, prove or disprove the charge. But you don't just kind of try to silence the whole thing. I think it's just counterproductive. Uh, it was affirmed, and I've got to get to this, the Order of Malta has basically outlawed the Roman Rite, the extraordinary form of the Mass, the Old Mass, in their liturgies. I want to read this to you. Austin Ivory wrote, this was a strong move designed to ensure that knights will not again be used as a fifth column for anti-papal anti-Vatican II traditionalists. Christopher Lamb wrote in, uh, in the UK, uh, the Grand Master's latest pronouncement banning the old rite is ruling out in stark terms the idea that the order can become a traditionalist bastion in opposition to this pontificate. Father Jerry, your take on that. Was Malta involved in an anti-papal agenda here by saying the old mass? Um, those two gentlemen are dealing in the realm of fantasy. Uh, the traditional mass, or it's called the extraordinary form, was authorized by a pope. First John Paul II and then Pope Benedict codified it. Uh, it is not anything anti-papal. Pope Francis, by the way, has done more to try and integrate the Society of Pius X back into the church than either of his predecessors were able to do. He's granted them powers to marry, to hear confessions. Uh, there's an ongoing dialogue with the Society of Pius X. No, 
the, the extraordinary form is not an exiled orphan who has to be kept out of the house. Mm. Uh, the extraordinary form is a beautiful form of the Mass uh, that the Pope himself, Pope Francis, attended as a child. He has not expressed hostility to it as a, as a form of the Mass. And to say that this is, you know, there's an attempt to turn the Order of Malta into a traditional organization. I'm a chaplain of the Order of Malta. It is an absolutely wonderful order lay people and then the monks, the fras, mm -hmm. uh, who work together to help the poor and the sick. Uh, you know, the Grand Master, who I respect, uh, I can't understand why he did this. Mm -hmm. It would have been nice, I, or better, I would say, if he had issued, as part of his uh, letter, an explanation of the harm that he saw in allowing the extraordinary form mass. He didn't do that. Maybe he'll do it at a later time. But, you know, those two commentators, I think, are politicizing something. Mm -hmm. uh, the old mass, the traditional mass, there's nothing wrong with it. It should be allowed. Uh, Robert Royal, uh, do, you, do you expect to see a pushback from Malta, from the people in Malta? Yeah, I think we will. I mean, a lot of these people are not wallflowers. They're mm -hmm. people who are very substantial people. And we know from other sources, Henry Sire, for example, mm -hmm. the British historian, that Fra Festing, the one who was actually asked to resign by the, by the Pope mm -hmm. uh, a couple of years ago, although he was himself uh, very much attached to the Latin Mass, the extraordinary mm -hmm. form of the Mass, did not impose that when yep. he was the, the Grand Master. He didn't even have it in his own chapel. There was a certain amount of liberty allowed among the different um, uh, Order of Malta mm -hmm. uh, chapters. So there's a, there's a kind of a, uh, it seems to me that there's a kind of a, a, a totalitarian impulse here, that everybody has got to fall into line in one way. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't seem to me to be a, a good thing for the church. The Holy Father is talking in, in the Amazon about allowing you know, certain cultural differences mm -hmm. to manifest themselves, but to, be, to be drawn into the unity of the and church. And to even teach the wider church. Right. And, and it just seems to me that it's politicizing uh, a, what is an ecclesial situation to say that, that to, to be in favor of the Latin Mass is somehow to be opposed to, to Pope Francis. I don't see the connection between those two things. Mm -hmm. You have to yourself think that somehow to be loyal to a, a form of the Mass that for a thousand years the Order of Malta celebrated, and as did the rest of the, the Western Church, that somehow that is to be in opposition to the current pope. That, that just seems to me to be a, a, a fantasy. Frankly. Well, Father Jerry, the other thing that came to my mind as I read this and watched the bishops' conference worrying about young people fleeing the church, I don't know about you, but when I attend the Latin Mass, as I occasionally do, uh, we have it in New Orleans, it's never stopped, it's filled with young people and young families. It's not old people there. It's all young people, younger than me. Uh, your thoughts on why they're attracted to this and why it has become a political football for some and something to be put down. Well, you know, I, I love the traditional mass myself. I say it privately and occasionally publicly. And I can say that people appreciate the reverence and the beauty uh, the response that man gives to the transcendent God through the sacral language, through the ancient rituals, uh, through the reverence. Uh, I agree with Cardinal Sarah, Mass facing liturgical east is mm -hmm. preferable. It draws people toward Christ and, and the crucifixion and the resurrection. You know, young people are looking for authenticity. They, that's always a, a note in youth, young people. They, yeah. they're, they don't want phoniness. Right. And sad to say, and I went through Catholic grammar in high school, a lot of post-Vatican II liturgies were kind of made-up jamboree-type events, thinking that young people like tambourines, guitars, and all the rest. Mm -hmm. Turns out young people like Gregorian chant, incense, silence. They like a priest who is there as a sacral minister and not as a you know, game show host trying to coordinate everybody <laughs> you know, in, in a you know, joint effort. You know, uh, the way the Mass is celebrated is very important for conveying what you believe about the Mass. Mm -hmm. And if the Mass is an instrument for the glorification of the celebrant, uh, then we've got a radically, uh, misunderst radical misunderstanding. The Mass is about Jesus Christ offering himself to the Father in an unbloody sacrifice, and we're the participants at that awesome mystery. Mm -hmm. So whatever contributes to a mysterious, reverential approach, that's why people like it. Yeah, and uh, I'll give you the last word, Bob. And, uh, and uh, Pope Benedict universalize the old mass as a way to remind us of the roots of the new mass and to hopefully sacralize 
and, and add reverence to the new mass. He wanted people to have both options. Yeah. As a friend of mine once said, uh, we're, we're in 2019, why am I still going to a 1960s hootenanny? <laughs> <laughs> but, I, you know, it's, it's true. People want something other than the everyday life that they're living in. And it just seems to me that it would have been proper and, and helpful to allow a little bit of plurality here. That has been our, that was our deep, beautiful Latin mass that we, we had for a thousand and more years. Yeah. Uh, it it takes people out of their everydayness and into something that they're looking for. Yeah, and if a group of if a if a fraternity of, of uh, a knighthood if they want to celebrate it and multa of all and things, and only some of them, right? Not, yeah, not it's all not universalized. If if they want to ad hoc celebrate the mass, what difference does it make? Anyway, we shall leave it there. As always, you can find commentary by Robert Royal and Father Gerald Murray at thecatholicthing.org. Gentlemen, thank you both for being here. She is the mother of Maddie Stepanek, the prolific poet peace advocate and philosopher who captured the hearts of media figures and the public alike. Oprah Winfrey, Larry King, Jimmy Carter, and countless others were touched by his message and the Catholic faith that informed it. Jenny Stepanek carries on his message despite her own physical challenges and is herself a courageous example of living and loving beyond disability and loss. I sat down with her here in EWTN's D.C. studios to talk about the state of Manny Stepanek's cause for sainthood and with his longtime friend, Cheryl Kerwin. She shares her thoughts on Maddie and the origins of his message of peace. Here's my exclusive interview with Dr. Jenny Stepanek. It seems Maddie's message has exploded in the last few months, in the last year or so. What's happening? Why do you think that is? And in um, what way is it exploding? Um, both Maddie's Foundation, which is the peace mission, and Maddie's Guild, which you founded um, to consider his cause of canonization. Uh, you're right, in the last six to 12 months, there's really been a transition from um, little events and organizing and kind of putting things out there to people saying, we want more. And um, with the foundation, we now have the governor of Maryland on board and the senators and all these schools and camps saying, we need more, we need more, we, we love this message. Mm -hmm. And really the guild that back in 2010, when you talked about it, 2012, when you founded it, mm -hmm. um, I feel like the first five or six years, it was really, what is this guild? Who yeah. is this guild? What does a guild even do? Yeah. And suddenly, in the last year, the Guild has nonprofit status. It has firm directors. It, it's moved from organizing mm -hmm. to gathering witness testimony um, and organizing that. Um, mm -hmm. at the website, social media, events. Um, why? Um, I, I, I would say there's really two major things going on. And one is. It's a new generation of people that are suddenly hearing about Maddie mm. for the first time because we're 15 years out from his presence on earth. And the other is that we're now also moving into almost 20 years some, since some major life events in our world. Mm -hmm. And back in 2001 when Maddie shared for our world and just peace and he's on Oprah for the first time. and. Mm -hmm. um, it's going on almost 20 years since then, and, and I think that we can do this. Peace is possible, life is worthy. Mm -hmm. I think people are realizing we need to commit ourselves to peace and hope and life and our neighbors mm -hmm. again. Tell me how Maddie was different from other children. I mean, you've, you've had your own children, you had grandchildren. Right. Why was he different? The things he spoke about at such an early age, um, one of the things I would like to impart is my Maddie moment mm. of his second birthday party. This is a, a child who was supposed to die. He was baptized uh, right after birth because mm -hmm. they weren't sure what was going to happen. Um, he then had a formal baptism. Mm. so. It kept progressing, and here we are now. He was two years old, um, living in a small house with a big backyard, is what I remember, because the birthday party was in the it was summer, mm -hmm. you know, July, summer, so I had a big party. And he, uh, you know, 
Maddie had a trait was you know he had learned to sign language because mm -hmm. he couldn't uh, breathe on his own when he was first born and for the in the beginning. So at that party, there were neighbors, there were those of us from his parish, Mount Calvary Catholic Church, and then doctors, nurses, and staff from the hospital mm. where he had you know, been in and out of all this time. Mm. And that's what struck me was these doctors and nurses that I spoke with walking around at the party to a person said they had no idea why he was here, hmm. that he should not have made it. They had no earthly, if you will, explanation. Tell me about that, that mission of peace, that message of peace. When did you become aware that this was important to him? I would say um, maybe a year or two after, when I, after his second birthday, um, my next Maddie moment is in Upper Marlboro, Maryland, at their, the home they were living in, the home they had. He was about three-ish, mm -hmm. three and a half, four. And again, the level of a child that age, yes, he played. Um, he was obviously, because he was home, he was well enough mm -hmm. to be doing things. He, he wasn't in the hospital but he would be in costume a lot of times, either when I arrived or shortly after I arrived, he'd have a, a sword in his hand, he'd be a knight, mm -hmm. he'd be Robin Hood. <laughs> he was a dragon, I think, one time when mm -hmm. I went over. And, but then you never knew, I mean, he was in talking. And this is when I realized, and you know, how astute Jenny was, that she was writing things down. Mm -hmm. These these were his poems. These were these beginning poems. And it was like, what child at three talks about God, talks about heaven? Mm -hmm. um, and he was a regular churchgoer, so it wasn't completely unusual, but the level of like knowing where heaven was. Mm -hmm. No, my three-year-old granddaughter wouldn't have known that. Mm -hmm. um, and then he'd run around and all of a sudden he'd be in front of us and say, why is there war? Why are people hating each other? And again, that's not normal talk for a mm -hmm. child that age. Now he was also a lector at your parish. Well, that was the next, my next Maddie moment mm -hmm. is, it wasn't my parish. She oh. had um, moved to another, this was that most holy rosary. Okay. Um, but when I found out, my husband and I found out that he was lecturing already at this young age, we would go sometimes to Mass when Maddie was there. And again, knew this was different. This is a child at this young age. He knew, Raymond, he knew what he was saying. He knew he was proclaiming the Word of God. And you were also struck by how attuned he was to current events at a young age. One of my favorite of his poems is the note to Bosnia. Mm -hmm. um, so that was something he'd, I mean, again, what child is yeah. watching that on TV and being affected by it? What do you think of the, of the possibility of the prospect of Maddie and a cause for Maddie moving forward? Did you see that virtue? that heroic virtue. To me, again, he was beating the odds, not just with his physical mm -hmm. disabilities. Um, I was unfortunately or fortunately around for the divorce time period too. Mm -hmm. um, and that, you know, there were things there that were definitely affecting Maddie, but yet he was still full of joy. He was still mm -hmm. a fun loving, young little boy. Mm -hmm. um, so I felt like he was beating adversity. I've always been struck in reading Jenny's book and talking to people who knew him, uh, his concern for other people. Yes. What Very. did you see of him going out to others, concern for others? When I went to book signings, um, his care for the, I mean, he was mesmerizing to both children and adults, mm -hmm. because most of them had already read some of his poetry, seen some of it, and now 
you know, we're coming to get an yet another of his books. Mm -hmm. And his care, you know, he might not have been feeling well. He might not have been his best on his best day, but you sure didn't know it. Mm -hmm. You didn't, the kids were all, you know, he wanted to talk to them individually. Mm -hmm. That was, to me, you know, striking. Um, yeah. He's definitely someone that God gave the fruits of the Holy Spirit, love, joy, peace, generosity, and he used those gifts. So many of us don't use those gifts, but he did. Tell me about the cause. Um, in November, the, the prayer, Maddie's prayer was unveiled. Yes. It was a nice, huge reaction to it. Yes. Um, where do you see the cause now? And it's got to be difficult as his mother to see this cause taking shape, which is moving toward canonization. Where the cause is now is as more people are either remembering Maddie, they're, they're re-remembering him, or they're learning about him for the very first time in school or through news or through the Peace Day events, as that's happening, we're getting this sudden surge of people that are sending through social media, through letters, through snail mail, through email. Maddie inspires me, Maddie inspires me. My life is different um, because of Maddie. And where the cause is now is trying to help people know how to share that information in a way that would advance the cause. And I know on the maddieforsainthood.org website, uh, they're also asking, to be a part of creating Maddie's Book of Virtues. What yes. is that? My understanding of that is that the beginning of the cause, and, and the mommy of me says, this is the hardest part, mm -hmm. okay? It, it is establishing that this is a child who lived a challenging life, not just disability. Mm -hmm. He also knew what it was like to be bullied. He knew what it was like to watch a world falling apart when he feels like his job is to be a peacemaker and a messenger of hope and peace. Mm -hmm. So it's more than disability that was his suffering. Mm -hmm. He knew what it was like to bury siblings, to have a mother with a disability, to go through divorce. Um, mm -hmm. so, um, so to establish that he lived a challenging life and yet chose to live that life with purpose from God, to live in a virtuous way, to live with kindness, hope, faith, peace, um, charity, um, you know, all the things that we define as virtues. So to establish that both through everything that he wrote, everything that people wrote about him and to him when he was alive, and then to support that with letters and testimony from people who either remember him right. or never knew him but knew of him or are learning of him now. And you asked earlier um, how hard that is for me. Right. Um, on one hand, it's, it's very exciting to think that my son's life, which he lived his life for God, he lived with purpose, with choice, deliberately sharing messages that were placed in his heart by God. And he chose to play after storms. He chose to comfort the, the baby in the next bed in the ICU rather than tend to his own emotions. He did that for God, and so it's very exciting, and, and I'm in awe that here we are 15 years later and it's advancing. It's also difficult because yeah. it means my son is not here. I would so much rather have my son turn 29 this summer and I say, where do you want to go for dinner? Mm. Then where are we going to have a Maddie symposium so we can tell people about his life? What do you think as a mother when you read these recollections and remembrances of Maddie? I mean, are you learning anything about him? Oh, I am. There are, there are stories that, that people share that I didn't know. I mean, people remind me of things that I've forgotten. Um, I continue, I mean, I'm getting letters from, there, there's a, a man that is taking Maddie messages to youth in Rikers Island, that are incarcerated mm. youth. And then the youth who aren't even allowed to have pencils with erasers because they might take the metal off. I mean, so they're writing with little stubby pencils letters to me about Maddie's character is teaching me that I can choose my character, that even if I live a rough life, um, even if my parents are divorced, or even if I've witnessed violence, I can still choose hope and peace, and I can live a life of purpose. 
um, to, to hear things from people who have disabilities that are inspired or people who question life for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, um, yes, I mean, some of it is uplifting for me and some of it is new and it's all very inspiring. On June 22nd, this Saturday, there's a memorial mass for Maddie. Yes. Uh, Monsignor Pope will be leading that. Now, yes. Monsignor, who's been on our program before, he knew Maddie. Yes. Tell me, how yes. did he come into to cross your path in Maddie's? Uh, Monsignor Pope was Father Charles uh -huh. uh, back in the day. I went to his ordination, so I, I got to know Father Charles um, at a friendship and a, past, uh, a priest level. And across the years, as Maddie came in, he came to our house, he did home masses, he was, he was there. He asked to be present when Maddie's brother, Jamie, died, because hmm. he died at home. Um, and we just got to be good friends, and we've remained friends, and I'm hmm. so proud when I saw him become a Monsignor Pope yeah. instead of Father Charles. Right. And he will be doing the homily on June 22nd. Now, there's an annual peace day that yes. the foundation Yes. Runs and hosts every year. Yes. Uh, that's on July 13th. It's in Rockville. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you expect will be different about this year's Peace Day? This year's Peace Day is different in a couple of ways. One will be, I hope, the size and the magnitude. Last year we made a leap from 100, 200 people to somewhere between 500 and 700 people. Mm -hmm. And I really am hoping for a thousand and one, so I can say more than a thousand people came to Peace Day. So we'll have more activities, more people, you know, more, more presence from elected leaders who are now turning to Maddie for how do I be an elected leader, represent the people, and stay rooted to tending to basic human needs and neighbors getting to know neighbors and building hope and peace in my community. Mm -hmm. The other thing is that the Guild will actually have a table in mm -hmm. our Cake and Conversation um, uh, community tent. As you said, Maddie would have been 29 this July 17th. What's the heart of that message that goes on? It's needed. That hope is real. It's not an illusion. And, and that hope is an energy that moves us into the next moment. That peace is possible. And here's how peace is possible. Get to know your neighbor. Talk to your neighbor. Educate. Tend to basic human needs. Learn to be okay with yourself. Even if you're different and have challenges, you can still be okay if your needs are tended to. Mm -hmm. And when you are okay, move from here to here and ask mm -hmm. your neighbor, are you okay? learn about resilience and kindness, teach this to other children, to elected leaders, um, and that life is worthy. As you look forward to his possible sainthood, how do you see that cause proceeding? If you had to define what Maddie might advocate formally. I know what I would say would be what Maddie wanted to advocate for. And Maddie wanted to advocate for all people, particularly children and youth, because children and youth then inspire adults and leaders who want to take care of the children and youth. So he saw that as the full circle. Maddie reached out to infants, to children, to teenagers, and to the elderly. He did not want to be limited to people with disabilities. He wanted to be a messenger for those youth who are on the streets and think they're caught in gangs. So I think Maddie today would be inspired knowing that the imam and pastor in Nigeria have brought Maddie's message to warring gangs that are Muslim and Christian, and they're now called Maddie's ambassadors, and mm -hmm. they're now peaceful with each other rather than hurting each other. I think he would want to be a messenger for all people who are searching for hope, searching for peace. For more on Maddie Stepanek's amazing life, Maddie's prayer, and the cause for sainthood, visit maddiematters.org. And for those of you in the D.C. area, the 15th anniversary Memorial Mass for Maddie will be celebrated on Saturday, June 22nd, this weekend, at St. Francis Catholic Church in Durwood, Maryland. All the details are at maddiematters.org including information on this year's Peace Day celebration on July 13th. 
And with the summer here, kids need to keep their reading skills up. I'm delighted with the pictures I've been receiving of kids getting their copies of Will Wilder 3, The Amulet of Power, and the rest of the series. The entire Will Wilder series is available now at bookstores everywhere, online at the EWTN catalog, and I promise you those reluctant readers will tear through it. That's all the time we have for now. Until next week, the show continues on Facebook and Twitter. You can like me on Facebook, follow me on Twitter. The links are at RaymondArroyo.com. Be sure to catch us next week. Until then, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, thank you for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo from Washington, D.C. Bye now.